Nine years ago, I was working in food service. No degree, no certifications, no tech background at all. My first steps into the IT world came when I landed a job as an entry-level network technician at an ISP. But what really accelerated my career wasn't that job. It was the hands-on lab environment that I ended up building using old switches and routers that I had found on Craigslist. I learned the basics of routing, switching, how to set up things like VLANs, access control lists, and even troubleshoot networks by actually doing it. It gave me a place where I could replicate real customer issues that I would see in my day-to-day -day job without the fear of breaking something. I went from kind of guessing how to fix customer problems to actually understanding the root cause and being able to propose solutions. You fast forward to today and I've worked for multiple vendors along the way, vendors like Cisco and VMware. I went from being a knock technician on the support side to working in engineering, senior engineering, solution design, and now on the pre-sales side. Along the way, I've seen my compensation skyrocket going up over 500%. My name is Ryan Ashcraft and I'm a senior systems engineer. I work with America's largest service providers to help them develop new networking and cybersecurity products for their end customers. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how to stand up a virtualized home lab for under a hundred bucks. We're gonna be looking at old server hardware. We're gonna stand up an open source hypervisor and even onboard our first virtual machine. And then in follow-up videos, we'll expand our lab to include two more virtual machines. We'll go through how to interconnect those and then a couple of different networking and security use cases. All right, let's talk about what's needed to build this lab. First off on the hardware side, you're going to need a USB thumb drive with at least 16 gigabytes of storage. You're gonna need a server or old computer. This doesn't have to be anything super high-end or the newest technology. All you need is a minimum of 16 gigabytes of RAM, 100 gigabytes of storage, and something that has newer CPU architecture that can support virtualization. You also need a monitor and a keyboard to plug into the server for the initial setup phase. And then on the software side, You'll need the Proxmox installer, which I'll provide in a link below this video. The Ubuntu 2404 installer, again, provided in a link below this video. And then you'll need a software downloaded uh, like Belena Etcher or Rufus that helps in creating your bootable USB drive. We will download the Proxmox installer, write it to the USB drive, and then you can boot your server from that thumb drive once complete. As far as the server hardware goes, I have two different servers in my home lab. So I have a Dell T5810, and then I have an HPE DL360 seventh generation. My Dell server is 10 years old. My HPE server is 15 years old. Both of these servers can be found for under $100. You also don't have to use traditional server hardware. If you have an old desktop or your buddy has an old desktop computer lying around, as long as you have 16 gigabytes of RAM, you have 100 gigabytes of free storage. You could use something like that to get your home lab started. My home lab has gone through several different iterations. Like I said, I started with an old AdTran router, Juniper SRX firewall, and an AdTran layer three switch. I then went to all Juniper gear. I then inherited an old desktop computer from my workplace, then went to a Lenovo Think server, then to my HP server, and then now I primarily rely on my Dell server. So you don't have to get this right the first time, just get something that allows you to start building and go from there. All right, the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna download the Proxmox installer. Like I said, this link can be found in the description. We'll come here, we'll go to downloads. We'll find the ISO installer and we'll click download. Next, we will need the Belena Etcher software installed as well. So if you haven't done that already, you'll wanna to go to etcher.belena.io and download Etcher. I'm using an M-Series Mac, so I'm going to download ARM64 base for Mac OS. You can also use Rufus if you're using Windows to create your bootable USB. Once both of those are downloaded, you can open Belena Etcher. You'll want to plug your USB drive into your computer, and then you'll click Flash from File. You'll select your Proxmox ISO. You'll then select the target as your USB drive and then you'll click flash. Once that process is complete, you'll want to remove the USB drive from your computer, and then you'll take that USB drive and plug it into one of the ports on your server. At that point, you'll need to reboot your server. Your server should automatically boot into the Proxmox installer. However, if it doesn't, you need to check the boot order in BIOS to make sure that USB is the top option uh, so that the server will try to then boot from the USB drive and not from whatever is running on your current hard drive. Now that we're in the installer, we'll see the screen that says, welcome to Proxmox virtual environment. My server only has a VGA output and by default, the Proxmox 9.0 grub menu does not support that low of resolution. 
So to get around an error here, you have to hit the letter E on your keyboard, open up this menu, and then go to the line that says Linux and add the word no mode set, all one word, no spaces at the end. You'll then hit Control X and the server should boot into the install process. You'll need to accept the license agreement and then next you will verify the installation target, which is the disk in your server. On the next screen, you will set the country, time zone, and keyboard layout. From there, you will set up a password, which will be your administrative password for the Proxmox host. And then lastly is the IP configuration. So Proxmox will default to DHCP. Uh, however, you can change this to static IP addressing if you'd like. If you're not that familiar with static versus DHCP, my recommendation would be just leave this as DHCP for now. Write down this IP address as you'll need this to navigate to in your browser shortly. Click install and Proxmox will go through the installation process and then reboot. Once the installation process is complete, you'll need to remove the USB stick from the server uh, because remember we changed the BIOS settings telling it to boot USB before hard drive. Now we need to remove the USB drive so that it boots to Proxmox, which has been written to the hard drive. Now that installation is complete, we can log in and configure Proxmox from the UI. We'll take the IP address that was handed to us either via DHCP or that we set statically, and we'll navigate to that IP in our browser. So for me, it is 172.16.16.44 .16 .16 on port 8006. Port 8006 is the default UI port. We'll log in with the username of root and then the password that we set up in the installation phase. As soon as we log in, we see a pop-up which says no valid subscription. You can click OK here. One of the first things we need to do is assign the free license tier to our server. So we'll go to PVE, and then I'll look for updates and repositories. And then under repositories, you will see two different enterprise licenses listed. So this first one here, under our uh, ceph.sources, and then the second one down below under pveenterprise.sources. We'll want to highlight both of those, and you'll have an, a disable option here, so we want to disable them. So once they're disabled, you'll see them grayed out here. And then we want to add the no subscription licenses. So in order to do that, we'll click Add, click OK, and then you'll go type no subscription, and you'll click add, and then same thing for uh, the ceph.sources, you'll go add, okay, and then ceph squid no subscription and click add. And this will associate the no subscription licenses. This will allow you to receive package updates. Uh, we can validate that this works by navigating up one level to updates over here. And you can click this button which says refresh. And you will see reading package lists fetch however many kilobytes. Uh, and then eventually once the download completes, you'll see task okay. Once you see task okay, that means that you have associated the correct license here. You now can get the free license updates. If there's an error, you'll see that listed here saying that there's no subscription tied to your server. So you can close this. That's a one-time setup thing. Now to onboard our first virtual machine, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna navigate in this left pane to our local drive. I've already onboarded a couple VMs. You'll see them listed here. We'll come into this left pane and we will find our hard drive. So for me, it's this local PVE. I can see I've used 12 and a half percent. First, what we have to do is, is upload the operating system for our virtual machines. So under here, we'll see this tab labeled ISO images. We'll come in here and you'll click upload and then you'll do select file. What we're looking for is this Ubuntu 2404 live server. This is uh, in a link below. You can download it from Canonical's website. So we would go select file and we would find that within our file system and then click upload. That'll take a few minutes, uh, but once it's complete, we'll see it listed here. You'll see the date it was uploaded, the type, and then the file size. Now that we've uploaded the operating system, we can spin up a virtual machine from this operating system. So I already have one that's running here. We'll spin up a second one. I'll go create virtual machine in the top right. I can name this uh, second Ubuntu VM. I would click next. I would select my Ubuntu ISO image. 
Here I would change any of my system settings. I'm gonna leave all of mine default. I can assign disk. So here I have 32 gigs of disk. I could change this to 40 or 80 or however much disk space this virtual machine needs. On my CPU front, I can say how many sockets and then how many virtual cores. So I'll say two virtual cores, single socket. And then we'll assign this guy four gigs of RAM. So 4096, click next. We can associate to our bridge interface. This is the default interface. Uh, so at this point, the Ubuntu machine would be connected to the same network, this 172.16.16 network. That's fine for now. In the follow-up video, I'll go more into the networking configuration side of things. Click next and then finish. So we see this 103 VM get populated here. We can go ahead and start that virtual machine. And then once the virtual machine starts, we can click console and we can log into the console here and install our Ubuntu OS. While this is completing, you can see over here, I've already installed a Kali Linux VM as well as a PFSense firewall virtual machine. The process is the same. First, you need to upload the ISO and then you'll create the virtual machine. For both of these or all three of these, you can use four virtual cores, eight gigs of RAM as a baseline. Uh, you could potentially get away with two cores, four gigs of RAM for Kali and Ubuntu. Typically, I like to go give a little more resources to my firewall, um, but it's the same process. So I would suggest go ahead and spinning these other VMs up before you continue to the next video. We'll go ahead and configure our, our Ubuntu VM. So we'll do this as English, keyboard layout is English in my case. I'm going to install Ubuntu server. And then I wanna leave this as DHCP for now. I'm gonna pull an IP from my existing DHCP server. You can change this to static, but in my follow-up video, when we start looking at creating different VLANs within Proxmox, and then assigning virtual machines to a specific VLAN to connect into the firewall, you may have to re-IP. So my suggestion would be just leave this as DHCP as long as you have DHCP set up right now. We don't need a proxy address um, done here. And then we want to use our entire disk. So again, we'll go to done. And this is more of a system summary screen. We'll click done again. Yes, we want to continue. We'll set up our name. We'll name our server. So I'll go second Ubuntu VM. Username in my case is gonna be uproot. And then you can set the password to log in. We can skip enabling pro. We do want to install open SSH server and then I will skip on installing any of these other packages. We can always add these later. This process will take several minutes. Basically, you'll see all of the logs on this screen. Give it potentially 10, 15 minutes. Once this completes, you'll be able to log into this virtual machine through the console as well as through SSH. All right, now that my virtual machine is spun up, I can come in here and uh, I know that I was received this 172.16.16.48. You may not be able to run this IF config initially. So what you would have to do here is go sudo apt get install net tools. And this will install the package needed to run IF config. Now I can run IF config and I can see again, 172, 16, 16, 48. I can validate SSH connectivity as well. So this is from terminal on my laptop. I see that the Ubuntu machine is responding to ping. I can do SSH uproot, which is the username I set up in the Ubuntu install, at IP address 172.16.16.48. I'll receive a password prompt, and then I'll be able to log into my VM. Again, I can run ifconfig, and from here I can use any of the Ubuntu services. I hope you found this video helpful and decide to continue on with this lab exercise. In the next video, we're going to look at configuring our Kali Linux VM, as well as our PFSense firewall. We'll look at how we can use the network to access the management port on PFSense from our Kali Linux VM. We'll open up additional ports on the WAN side so that we can navigate to the PFSense management UI from other networks. And then we'll make changes to security policies as well as create VLANs within Proxmox to stitch it all together. And then in the third video, once the network has been set up, we will look at a couple of different use cases, how we can use this lab to analyze things like packet captures and security logs.